If you're like most people, you probably don't think about your evolutionary relationships with animals very often. But our place in the animal kingdom has been a centuries-long cause for debate. Today, I'm going to break it down for you. My name is Riley Harnett, and this is The Heap. In 1859, an as-yet unbearded Charles Darwin released On the Origin of Species. You know it as a book that blessed us with the theory of natural selection, but Darwin also marveled at how, as a result of natural selection, the different and many varieties of life must have a common descendant. From this single life form over billions of years, life has changed and adapted to new circumstances. Evolved, if you will. Everything alive today descended from that common ancestor. But all those species also descended from intermediary forms as well. Whales and hippos both evolved from the same semi-aquatic hoofed ancestor around 54 million years ago. Camels and llamas shared a common ancestor somewhere in the Americas around 25 million years ago. Even you and all plants share a common ancestor likely more than 1.6 billion years old. That's a little more than one-tenth of the time that the universe has existed. What I'm getting at here is that all animals are either siblings or cousins on the evolutionary tree. Sounds weird to call a tree your cousin, I get it, but it's like a really deep cousin you're barely even related. All that preamble is cool and all, but you're watching the heap and we only really care about human origins. In my opinion, we are the most remarkable animal. We're the first to invent art, to reach space, to cook food. As the famous astronomer Carl Sagan said, we're a way for the universe to understand itself. We're not nothing, and to understand why we're so remarkable, we have to think about where we came from. But before we can begin to fathom what sorts of things happened in our evolutionary history, we need to be able to organize all that fossil material that we've collected over the years. It's a lot like solving a jigsaw puzzle. It's much easier to figure out when you organize all your pieces and have a general idea where they go. Problem is, we don't have the picture in the box to work off. So it's easiest to start with the edge pieces. In this hopefully not too confusing analogy, those are the species alive today. Our sister species, that edge piece next to ours, is crucial to understanding our remarkableness. It gives us that sweet, sweet context to understand who our last common ancestor was and what changes happened when our lineage split off. It's the beginning of humanity's story, and no book is complete without that first chapter. So then, who exactly is our sister species? In 1863, a colleague of Darwin, Thomas Henry Huxley, attempted to use anatomy to assess exactly that. His argument works like this. Whichever animal had the most physical similarities to humans is likely the most closely related. Evolution works slowly, so if two species diverged more recently, it follows that we would expect for them to be the most anatomically similar. I mean, we're distantly related to trees, but because evolution has had so much time to act on us both, we don't really look anything like them. Also, evolution isn't always clean, and sometimes different species evolve similarities with animals that they're not closely related to. Think of birds and bats. They both have wings, but bats are mammals, and we all know that they didn't descend from birds. Understanding the rate of evolution is also tricky. Smaller populations, for example, can evolve more quickly than larger ones. Even still, Huxley had to start somewhere. He concluded that either chimpanzees or gorillas were the most likely candidates. Because comparing species based on physical similarities has some problems, science needed a different line of evidence. Molecular biology. This field concerns itself with the activities of cells, how they communicate, the effects that chemicals have on them, and in our case, the forms that these processes take between species. Before we had access to entire genomes, we had to rely on more accessible things. We couldn't look at genes so easily, but we could look at the proteins they serve as blueprints for. In 1967, one of the first molecular arguments was published. These researchers compared the form of lumbin proteins in humans and apes. And no, you don't need to know what they are. All that matters is that we knew these proteins were passed on from one ape ancestor to the next, and they evolve at fairly regular rates between species. The researchers then used some fancy math to determine how long these proteins were evolving independently of each other. This led them to conclude that the split between the common ancestor of humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas happened about 5 million years ago, and the split between humans and orangutans happened around 8 million years ago. These dates aren't considered particularly accurate today. 
It's difficult to figure out with absolute certainty how fast these proteins evolve, and how consistent that rate is. Ultimately, you would need to know how many mutations occur across the species each generation. That's hundreds of thousands of generations of animals that don't exist anymore, so don't expect that paper to come out anytime soon. The best we can do is model with what data we have and suggest a time range. As time progressed over the last 50 years, we've been able to collect better and better data with which to do this. In the 1980s, genetic studies became a thing, and we gathered more evidence that suggested chimpanzees were closer relatives than gorillas. The chimpanzee genome was sequenced in 2005 and reconfirmed our understanding that chimpanzees are indeed our closest relatives. Currently, Genetics has a split between humans and chimpanzees at 5.9 to 7.3 million years, gorillas at 8.1 to 10.1 million years, and orangutans at 14.2 to 17.6 million years. I imagine over the next 50 years, those times will be refined even further. Chimpanzees and humans are genetically very similar. You might have heard that only 1.23% of our genome differs. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually around 35 million differences the impact of each difference varies wildly. Most have little to no effect at all, and some could trickle down to affect thousands of genes. Sharing 99% of our DNA with a chimpanzee doesn't make us 99% chimpanzee, and it's a small percent of that small percent that makes us so different. We also have one chromosome pair less than the other great apes, 23 to their 24. What practical effects this has, if any, is as far as I can tell, still unknown. Genetics is really complicated, and this is a challenging topic to write about, believe me. But it's about to get even more complicated. There's still a slight chance that all of what I just told you is completely wrong in the most monumental way. Some quite legitimate researchers are open to the possibility that chimpanzees may not be our sister species. For the genetic argument to hold weight, we need to make sure that the most genetically similar species is indeed the most closely related. That sounds like a pretty safe assumption, but in 2009, a group of researchers argued that this is not necessarily the case. They offered a number of ways that you can end up with similar genetics, but not necessarily be closely related. For example, two species can evolve to have similar genome sequences without actually inheriting those genes from their ancestors. This is known as homoplasy. If you remove genetics from the equation, we're back to the beginning. Physical similarities. So that's what they explored. They compared a vast number of physical traits in humans and both living and extinct great apes. Their conclusion? Neither chimpanzees nor gorillas are our most closely related sister species. Instead, it's the orangutans. This is known as the red ape hypothesis. I want to be absolutely clear, it's a real hot take. In the 11 years since, genetics has become tighter. We've developed tools for detecting homoplasies, We've sequenced the orangutan and gorilla genomes, and all these studies provide results that are generally pretty consistent with one another. As we continue to learn about the genetics of us and our great ape relatives, nothing seems to unseat chimpanzees as our best evidenced evolutionary sibling. The red ape hypothesis was also tested using a combination of genetic and physical evidence. This study was structured to determine if our current understanding was methodologically flawed. And as you might have guessed, it supported chimpanzees as our sister species. This doesn't change the fact that there are a number of commonalities between humans and orangutans that don't exist with humans and other great apes. We both have bald foreheads, we can smile with our mouths closed, and we have sex for much longer periods of time. There's many more, but despite chimpanzees being our sister species, these commonalities still have the potential to help us understand what makes us human. Over those millions of years of evolution, some of these traits may have persisted in humans and orangutans, but disappeared in chimpanzees and gorillas. If so, that helps us read the fossil record better. We might have an easier time figuring out where species fit on the tree of life based on a logical progression of those traits. You know, those puzzle pieces. It also gives us new questions to explore. If the ancestor of humans and orangutans had a bald forehead, why? Why did chimpanzees and gorillas evolve away from it? Now it's also possible that orangutans and humans evolved those traits independently of one another. Those bald foreheads might have just popped up in the orangutan and human lineages without either species inheriting it from a common ancestor. 
That's also interesting. We can understand what evolutionary pressures and environments lead to similar adaptations. I get it if you don't care about the evolutionary history of bald foreheads. Maybe you'd rather know why we walk on two legs, why we have large brains, or why our hands are so short compared to the apes. These are the ways that we gain evidence for understanding those things too. Figuring out where those puzzle pieces go tells a story. It's a story that's millions of years long. It's full of twists and oddities and mysteries yet to be solved. It's a story of humanity, and I think it's important to know your roots. Thanks for watching.